Mike Farrell is an actor, producer, writer, and activist who is best known for his role as B.J. Honeycutt in the iconic TV series MASH. He's produced a number of films including Dominique and Eugene and Patch Adams and appeared in the television series Providence on NBC and The Red Road on the Sundance Channel. He's the author of Just Call Me Mike, A Journey to Actor and Activist, and of Mule and Man. He stars in the play Dr. Keeling's Curve, a one-man show that was created by playwright and activist George Shea. And George Shea is in the house with us. He's an activist and a playwright, author of Dr. Keeling's Curve, a play about the life of Charles David Keeling. And we're going to be talking about Keeling and the play. Mike Farrell, George Shea, thank you very much for being on the Now Man Show. Thank you. Pleasure, thank you. Uh, George, I'll start with you. Where did you get the inspiration to write a play about a scientist? Well, I tell you, I, um, it was a column in the New York Times, Tom hmm. Friedman, 2010, February 2010. And I'll just read you an excerpt from the column that inspired it. He says, although there remains a mountain of research from multiple institutions about the reality of climate change, the public has grown uneasy. What's real? The climate science community should convene its top experts from places like NASA, uh, the MIT, Stanford's Caltech, and the UK Met Office Hadley Center and produce a simple 50-page report. They could call it what we know, summarizing everything we already know about climate change in language that a sixth grader could understand with unimpeachable peer-reviewed footnotes and so on. He says at the same time they should add a summary of all the errors and wild exaggerations made by climate skeptics and so on, where they get their funding. So mm -hmm. yeah, that struck me as a reasonable idea. Most people today, they're too uh, busy, too intellectually lazy to read a 300 page book on their subject. <laughs> yeah, okay? that's true. It's true, yeah. 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 So yeah, I read a bunch of them and, and uh, <clears throat> I thought to myself, I've written a lot of children's books. This right. could be a nice children's book about Keeling. So that was the original idea. That was the original idea. Book. I couldn't find a publisher. Yeah. Uh, one guy said to me, "Nobody ever heard of this guy. Yeah. Now, how am I going to sell? How am I going to sell books? You know." So I thought, well, okay. I'd, I'd done a one-man play already before, so I said, I'll, "I'll write a one-man show about Keeling." And then I thought, well, nobody will pay any attention to it if I play Keeling. And one day, one rainy. She was about six years ago. I was with my wife, and she said, we were walking around. She said, oh, this is Mike Farrell's house. I said, oh, really? Yeah. And I turned around. I saw Mike taking out his garbage. And I said, God wants me to do this. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I ran up to yeah. him, and I said, Mike, how do you feel about global warming? And that started it. Yeah. That's fantastic. I didn't know that. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, and Mike, uh, at first, y you, you talked about... Um, it was not a play, right? Well, when he first brought the draft to you, right? right. When George came up yeah. with the idea, yeah. I thought the idea was exciting yeah. and yeah. certainly necessary today. But I said, you know, the big problem is uh, it has to be a play. Yes. It can't be a lecture. Right. Because nobody's going to come listen to me lecture, nor are they going to come listen to you lecture about this subject. So George said, well, let me, let me, I've got an idea. Let me see what I can do to flesh it out. And he did. We went back and forth, I think, over a few uh, versions. Yes. All right. I'm and then sure. finally, I was working uh, on a different show at a theater in uh, Los Angeles, and um, I gave it to the, to the director, and I said, I think you might find this interesting. Is that the Blank Theater? That was the Blank. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she did. She thought it was quite terrific. And so the three of us then began to collaborate on what needed to be fixed or how we could, you know, emphasize one thing. And, and George, of course, is the walking encyclopedia now about yes. climate change, but what he had to do was keep us up to date on all the new developments and the new signs that we were uh, going to have to articulate to people so that we were not talking about history, we're talking about what's happening today. Yes. So, the, but it's the perfect connection though to start with a historical context. Right. And then as you do it live, you're updating the the stats, the statistics, basically, which oh, you, you have mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. But, but you have to do more than that. You have to, you have to bring people to an understanding, you know, mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. history. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that tells us 
that we're not just sort of making this up out of whole cloth, that this That's has right. been developing over many years. Scientific understanding has developed over many, many, many years. Um, but even so, there are things that need to be brought up so that people sort of put it in a context. Because talk about global warming, and you can have Senator James mm -hmm. Inhofe throwing yeah. a, snow, snowball a snowball on the, right. on the floor of the yeah. Senate, and he says there's no such thing. Um, the concept of global warming, which I think people uh, politically have decided to call climate change, yeah, yeah. Um, is something that most, although we are now finding every year getting warmer, and some people are saying, oh, well, they did talk about global warming, didn't they? Yes. Um, but I think, I think what it needed was uh, relevance. It needed relevance to our lives today, and George was able to do that. Yeah, brilliantly. A lot of people can learn about who this person was. And actually, didn't he start his career right down the street here at Caltech? Yes, he did, yeah. yeah. How long was uh, he here? Uh, he was here about not that long, actually. Um, it was one of those accidents. A lot of a lot of discoveries are, are accidents. Yeah. Keeling just wanted to get out of he had, he was given a job, mm -hmm. uh, putting rocks into. They, yeah. they were trying to see if they could extract uranium from granite. Okay, he didn't want to he, do he it. He didn't want to yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. he called he it thought, the, yeah, the yeah. dungeon, right? Where they wanted exactly. to send him yeah. to the dungeon. <laughs> yeah. So he thought to himself, if I can get out of doing this, uh, you know, find something. More, more stimulating. Yeah, yeah. And he overheard a conversation his professor was having about CO2. Yeah, yeah. And, and he ran up to him and he said, you know, I'm not sure I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> okay? yeah. And that, that started it. But the thing about the, uh, the play about Keeling is if you can tell the story of Keeling's life and work, mm -hmm. uh, you can explain climate change to people. And you yeah. put a human, a human face on it, uh, Mike, Mike Farrell's. Yeah. And yeah, it, it does work. And it also, the, the, the point of making it a play and not a lecture is just that. So people identify. People are, meet this guy right. who nobody, uh -huh. you know, most people hadn't, except in the scientific community, most people hadn't heard of. But you meet him, you hear about his meeting his wife, you hear about his, the, de the development of his family. So people are then pulled into it because it's somebody they can recognize and to sort of take a ride with. Yeah. It's, it's, you're, you're creating his personality and you're bringing that out right. in, in the play so that people can make a human connection to it exactly. while they're learning what is actually the, the storyline actually is. Which is the whole point of theater, identification. Right. If exactly. you identify, then you can take that ride. If you don't, you sit back and you say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm bored, goodbye. Exactly. And, and speaking of that, you're interjecting some humor yeah. to, to make that relevant. And, and that's a, that's, that shows a great writer right there, by the way. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job with that. Thank you. Thank you for doing that, speaking for myself personally. Now, let, let's look at Keeling himself. Now, when he first started, when, did, it, did he come up with this, this parts per million thing? Oh, no, that, no. That, that preceded him. Yeah. He knew nothing about carbon dioxide. Oh, he didn't? No, this is 1953, okay? Uh, CO2, people thought of Coca-Cola. That was about it. <laughs> yeah, that's serious. right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so he figured, well, I'll see, see what work has been done. He surveyed yeah. the work that was, most of it was being done in Sweden. As a matter of fact, mm. all of it in mm. Scandinavia. Wow. And he decided pretty quickly that they did, uh, it was totally disorganized. Uh, you know, they, they were taking readings all over the place, using different equipment, different technicians. And he came up with his own methodology, which was remarkably simple. First, you have to collect an air sample. So yeah. he invented a flask to do that. And then you have to measure it. Yep. And he uh, discovered this thing called a manometer and uh, adapted it. And that was it. He was off and running. But it took him, I, I think anyone else probably would have done the experiment in, in like a week. Keeling took a year. Wow. Uh, yeah. He was really a perfectionist. He, yeah. wanted to, he wanted to understand that it was, in fact, happening. And he wanted to see how, uh, the, what the process was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's, you know. One of the great things about the guy, and it's something many people I think identify with, is what drove him west and what drove him into science was his love of the outdoors, particularly mountains. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and he he, he was uh, he liked the science in nature. Oh yeah. Which yeah. all of us do really. Sure. When we're young, we that's when we first understand that hey, you know, you go to right, a river, right. or you go to the beach, or you, right. you, right, you know, right. you make that connection automatically, and that, right. it arouses yeah. and what. What makes this happen? How does this work? Yeah, he and that's where it realize, starts. He didn't realize, though, right away that 
the CO2 was grow going mm -hmm. up, that it was, mm -hmm. could be a problem. Uh, and then he discovered quickly that all the afternoon readings showed the same number, 310, mm. 310 mm -hmm. ppm. Mm -hmm. He went all over California, all over the West, even mm. on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Everywhere it was the same number. Hawaii too? Yeah. And he eventually went yeah, to... Oh, sure. It's the know. same all over the planet. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, was, that was a startling discovery. Yeah. yeah. To, could it be? Could it be that the, the 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 number is the same all over the world? Yeah. And if so, what does that mean? Well, what we found out is it means that, that it's rising and that we are in danger as a result of that rise. And of course, just like any other scientific study, it takes years to really have enough data to be able to project forward, which right. is what sure. he did. Mm -hmm. And he did this during the course of the 1950s and 1960s, correct? Uh, he did it the rest of his the next yeah. 50 years. He did it until his death in 2005. Oh, really? Yeah. So he continued yeah. to do it. He was oh, still sure. measuring. Yeah. And there were yeah. just other people doing it, too. Not uh, enough. No? Not, not enough. enough. Some. No, yeah. Yeah. Some. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was very guarded about that. He was yeah. very, oh, I see. Yeah. That would make sense. The government wanted to start its own program, and he resisted that for years. And finally, he gave in. Uh, Noah wanted to do it. This was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the guy in charge of the program had worked for him. Mm. So he knew he must have been okay. Well, he that, gave that his... makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. You, you want to make sure that, that it's pure science and that, that you're getting real data. Yeah. Well, and that, that's the important piece. It wasn't uh, want of wanting to protect his own discovery. It wasn't about selfishness. It was exactly. really about protecting the science and yeah. making absolutely sure that everything measured up as it began to appear clear to him that it was the case. And then how do you measure it and how besides going out and getting vacuum tubes full of, of uh, oxygen, he discovered or came up with the idea of investigating how to get old oxygen out of uh, ice cores. Wow. Oh, yeah. The permafrost? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. He yeah. was also involved in that? Indeed. Yeah. Really? I did in not. The, wow. Uh, around 1980. Phenomenal. Yeah. 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 That's, I, see, I, I, I learn things all the time. Yeah, they you discovered know? there were bubbles inside the ice cores. They'd never been able to get inside. There was CO2 in there. And uh, they analyzed the CO2. They discovered an almost perfect correlation between CO2 and temperatures. In the past, thousands of years ago, as, as CO2 levels went up, temperatures went up with them. Mm -hmm. As they went down, same story, temperatures went down. So he realized, and it sounds bizarre, but CO2 acts like a thermostat for climate mm -hmm. on this planet. That's amazing. Yeah. And it, was it your line or was it his, the miniature ice museums or whether oh, that's I, I, I love that idea. Yeah. That inside, it, it, this discovery that inside these uh, yeah. ice cores yeah. were these little tiny, tiny museums yeah. that you could yes. break open and move into if they could figure out how to do it. Up until uh, he and his son went to Switzerland, right? Um, that's, that's and and, and worked work. with a French team. Right. Um, they discovered how to capture the... Uh, the uh, oxygen inside mm -hmm. and measure it. Mm -hmm. Wow. See, the, the idea that CO2 is the same all over the planet is true, but that's only in nature. And that was Keeling's take, that, that, that was the thought he had, because he wanted to do science in nature. So the government probably was very interested in his studies then, or, or not? No. No? No? <laughs> no. They, they canceled his program in yeah. 1960, the end of 1963. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there were three months in early 1964 where there were no measurements of CO2. Yeah. Uh, Kennedy wanted to send, uh, wanted to send um, oh. astronauts to the moon, and that it was, was very expensive. And I'll, I'll say this, I'll just interject this, but I really wonder if we're going to hear a lot of talk about going to Mars, and that's really what we should be doing. You know? uh, it's a huge distraction. Uh, it, frankly, I, I think it's a fantasy. but. Well, I, yeah, I think it's, it sounds more like it's a distraction. Oh, yeah, knowing sure. Because cause the bottom line is we're talking about political economics. Absolutely right? right. And we've got big businesses out there whose existence is based on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it is, in fact, the fossil fuels that are creating this global warming or this climate change, call it what you like, they, that spells doom for them. And they That's don't right. want that to be the case. So That's you've right. got this actually a, a, a cult of deniers. Um, some of them are paid 
big bucks to come up with negative mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. to poo-poo the idea of fake global news. warming or climate. Oh yeah, fake news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, and and we should call it what it is in sure. my view because there's you know, like we've we've been talking and we're going to continue talking in another episode. You know, there's plenty of data. There's no need for denial or to call something a hoax. Well, when you have the IPCC, the, this in international group of scientists, 97 to 3 maintaining the, that the global warming is a very real phenomenon and it is dangerous. Yes. Uh, it, it seems to me that the, the arrogance of those people in the denialist camp is, is phenomenal. And, and what is this... Um, wasn't there, there was something in the news this week, there, there was an Associated Press story, and I saw it in the LA Times, I think online, it was even on the New York, New York Times link. Uh, three members of the Reagan era cabinet, mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. uh, did they have a meeting with the senior advisor in the White House, or do we know they, what's going They on had there? a meeting this past week, I don't mm -hmm. know what the result mm -hmm. was, but uh, about three years ago, Henry Paulson put mm -hmm. out a study called uh, the Risky Business Report. What is that? Well, uh, very simply, uh, if uh, climate change really takes off, you won't be able to do business, okay? They yeah. see it as a threat to business. And that, and that makes sense. I mean, I've heard climate scientists say to me, I don't think anything's really gonna change until the business community realizes uh, mm -hmm. it's a threat to their business, so. So, but can, uh, can it transition into a more green economy we have or, to yeah. I mean how how is that going to happen I mean we're, we're seeing in Germany and places like that where you know they don't even have as much nearly as much sun as we do here in California mm -hmm. and so <laughs> obviously it can be done with just solar but there's also wind there's also uh, geothermal mm -hmm. sure. you know you, you know you mentioned the economic imperative yeah if business wants to make a profit if they can find out that they can make a not only a profit but continue to the existence of yes. people on this planet that's right through this process of green economies uh, green businesses figuring out how to use uh, geothermal and mm -hmm. uh, solar mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all the the alternative technologies that are available to us instead of this insistent reliance on uh, fossil fuels, then there's hope. Yeah. And the contradictions, you know, like for instance, uh, I think uh, uh, in, in Texas, for instance, you know, while they're working on wind technology mm -hmm. for power, they're, they're mm -hmm. still doing the fracking, which is, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's like saying you're, for, you, you, you're not in denial of climate change, but let's still keep the fracking. Uh -huh. This is the insanity of the system right. where, uh, you yeah. know, where, where economic, uh, where political mm -hmm. economics really right. has to be talked about and examined and like, look, there are other ways of doing this. We have a serious crisis here. Yeah, it, but that's, uh, that's an important point, but it's not one that's going to be well met by the, the heads of Exxon Mobil, for yeah, example. Yeah, exactly. One of whom is now our Secretary of State. I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> and that, we're definitely going to get into that in, a, in another episode of, in, with some scientists as well to discuss more of these kinds of details and what can be done. But speaking of what can be done, mm -hmm. we're citizens activists mm -hmm. and we can talk about it too from our perspective. So in your perspectives, what can we do now to raise the awareness or just bring it to more people's attention? Well, something we can do uh, is join the Citizens Climate Lobby. I was at a meeting of the Citizens Climate Lobby this morning. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, some people from NASA, JPL, are there. Uh, basically, we lobby our members of Congress. Uh, I've been to the representative in Congress a number of times. Uh, once a year, they go down to Washington, they lobby every member of Congress. Uh, they're reaching out to Republicans. Uh, right now, we have something like uh, at least a dozen Republicans who have uh, members of Congress who are willing to... Uh, you know, make a state, join a statement about the uh, reach across the aisle, climate change. And that's it. Uh, but they want to get the message out, and they want to find a realistic way to get um, what they call a carbon fee and dividend. Mm. The idea is they would put a carbon fee on fossil fuels, mm. and they would start it out fairly low at like $15 a ton, and then they'd gradually increase it, and the money would not go to the government. 
All right, that, that would keep the Republicans happy. Uh, <laughs> they would send a check to basically to every American, sort of like mm -hmm. the way you'd get a tax refund. So maybe a family of four would get a couple grand or something a year? Something like that. Yeah. 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 But for those, for those people who aren't activists, for those people who aren't willing to go out and invest themselves at their, their time and their energy into joining an organization that is doing this kind of work, there is this play. Yeah. Yes. There is this play, and the play's been done now uh, at a number of places here on the West Coast, and one in uh, Arizona, and we did one in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, and it's now on DVD, and hopefully we can use this as, as, as a teaching tool for people who are interested in having a good experience watching a, a little over an hour on television, um, but to, or, or sit in an audience at a university or wherever we can do it, to be captured by this idea that this guy, this guy like you and me, who stumbled into something because he was curious and because he was in love with nature and because he had this kind of scientific bent, um, realized what was happening and brought it to the attention of the scientific community in a way that has now exploded, uh, hopefully not. But how in can a destructive uh, way. exactly and so people can go online and find this oh sure yeah. matter of fact it's, it's on uh, HD YouTube right now. great yeah. thank you so much gentlemen for being on the now man show I'm here with George Shea and Mike Farrell and you're watching the now man show Now, most of you have never heard of Dave Keeling, which is just fine with me. And uh, don't take this personally, but being here talking to you is not my idea of a good time. <laughs> I'm here because I love this planet. I had a family, children, grandchildren, and I, I loved them deeply. Still do. So I can't stand quietly by and watch everyone and everything I care about, including our civilization, suffer a grueling, painful, completely unnecessary catastrophe. There's nothing inherently evil about CO2. Relatively speaking, there's really not that much of it in the air, way less than 1%. But ounce for ounce, it's very powerful stuff, like uh, greed. Greed, speaking of the 1%. <laughs> One day, uh, around the fourth grade, we got a new teacher. This teacher began telling us that the phases of the moon were caused by eclipses. <laughs> by the moon passing between the earth and the sun. Huh? <laughs> I was horrified. I raised my hand. She ignored me. Finally, she kept going. I couldn't stand it. I stood up. I said, Miss Spencer, that's wrong. That's not true. You're talking about an eclipse. That's wrong. She gave me a look, told me to sit down and shut up. <laughs> Always had a problem after that with ignorant people in positions of authority. <laughs> you know, like Congress, for example. <laughs> Remember the cigarette companies, Philip Morris and Friends, what they did in the 1950s? The tobacco industry created a phony research institute that create, issued official appearing reports about how there was no real evidence linking cigarette smoking with cancer, heart disease, emphysema. Nine out of 10 doctors smoke camels, remember that? <laughs> Eight of them are dead. <laughs> These are from tobacco industry documents, and this is a real quote. Doubt is our product. Out. The industry's strategy does not require winning the debates it manufactures. It's enough to foster and perpetuate the illusion of controversy. Like greed, doubt is very powerful stuff. If you're looking for a reason not to believe something, try doubt. What's happening right now is that the Arctic is warming up twice as fast as the planet as a whole. In 30 years, since 1980, we've melted 80% of Arctic ice ice that was in place for about 125,000 years. 
The Greenland ice sheet covers 80% of Greenland, and it's melting. Unlike the Arctic ice, Greenland's ice is land-based. When it melts, sea levels will rise. Underneath the Arctic's permafrost is methane. Over a period of 100 years, methane is 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Some of the permafrost is a mile thick, and it holds twice as much carbon as the atmosphere does right now. It isn't all going to melt at once, but one projection is we'll see a melting of about 10 feet of worldwide permafrost in this century. And there's also a tremendous amount of methane buried under the ocean floor. There's methane deposits there that have been held in place by permafrost lids. As the ocean warms up, these lids are beginning to leak. We're seeing methane chimneys now bubbling up off the coast of, the, of Arctic Siberia. What can we do? For 130,000 years, human beings anatomically identical to us, with brains and native intelligence on a level with ours, lived on this planet. One generation followed another, and nothing ever changed. And then the climate changed. It warmed up. Sea levels rose. People came out of their caves, enjoyed the stable, relatively benign climate we've taken for granted for the past 10,000 years. Within 5,000 years, we had writing. First cities sprang up. All the advances that characterize modern civilization came about, learning, science, the arts, medicine. The new climate was stable. It's been remarkably, uniquely stable for the past 8,000 years. It's the only climate we've known on the only planet we have. And we've had a civilized world because we've had a civilized, stable climate. And now we're in danger of losing it. It's said that humankind is on a journey from the caves to the stars. If so, it's been a journey fraught with challenges. And at each of them, we have overcome those who would lead us back to the caves, who would stop us, the fear mongers, the haters, the doubters, the liars. Today, it's the profiteers who would fill you with doubt and lull you to sleep, ask you to deny your very senses. We have the ability to face what confronts us. What is needed is the will. Past is gone